Caitlin, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Um, I would like to bring our next storyteller to the stage, uh, which will be told by John Steinberg. Uh, John is the founder and CEO of Cheddar. He was recently named to Ad Age's uh, 40 Under 40. He sits on the board of Bustle and is an advisor to the Skim and Taboola. He was most recently uh, the CEO of DailyMail.com North America, and he joined DailyMail.com from BuzzFeed, where he formerly served as president and chief operating officer. So John, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Uh, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit. My, mine will not be as funny, I assure you. Uh, this, this, is, this is surprisingly hard to do, and I, I do this a, a fair amount, um, and I put off writing this, which is kind of surprising, not because I put it off, just because I, I, it, was, it was difficult to do, and I felt like Jill should really, uh, my wife Jill, who's the, uh, the BRCA pre-viver, I, I thought that she should be up here doing it, but she wanted me to do it. And I, I think, I guess the, the best rationalization I can have of it is that there are a lot of husbands or significant others in the room, so I'll, I'll try to tell that perspective of it. Um, and I took some notes, and I, you know, I do, I do four hours of live TV a day, and for some reason this is very, um, this is very nerve-wracking for me, because I haven't, I haven't really talked about this, I don't think. Um, okay, so this all begins with, uh, Jill, what year, 2000, 2011, I think, is that right? 2010. And I had just joined BuzzFeed. Um, and it was a stressful time. It was a stressful time for me because um, in, the board wanted to fire me the entire first two years of BuzzFeed. They thought that I wasn't good at it. The second two years, they thought I was a genius, but the first two years, they basically had um, a gun about as far down my throat as you could possibly imagine. Um, so it was stressful in that context, um, but things were, were good. We had just had Edie, our first child. Edie was um, 14 months old, just coming up on a year, uh, and we were happy and everything was really good. Now. Jill's sister had had breast cancer, and Jill's father had had prostate cancer. Um, we didn't really know about the gene, but Jill, but Sarah, Jill's sister, had been tested, and she had no kind of genetic abnormalities of any kind that they could link it to. Um, so I'm at work one day, and on Twitter, I love Twitter even then, they had something for World DNA Day, and 23andMe, the home genetic testing kit, was available to buy. And I wanted it because I wanted to know, like, do you like spicy foods? Do you like sour foods? Like, all, all the, because I'm a geek, and I thought it would be fun. And then I went to go check out, and I think it was like a two for one. And I was like, okay, I'll get one for Jill. We'll find out, like, you know, um, does Jill have recessive blue, uh, blue eyes or something like that. We take the kits. We do the kits. I spit in the vial. Jill spits in the vial. And then, um, because there's so many politically backward things in New York State, they don't allow you to mail the kits um, from New York. And because, you know, I've spent 150 bucks on these things, I don't want them to get seized by the post office. So as Jill's parents come in, I give them the kits, and they mail them from Connecticut. I get the results back, and I get an email back, and I'm about to go to bed one night. And let's say it's a Monday night, uh, and I figure, oh, well, I'll look at it when I go in the office, and who really cares because I'm going to find out if, I, if I, I like spicy food and if I'm, how much Ashkenazi and how much Sephardic I am and whatever. Uh, and I go to the office the next morning, and I used to get to work very early back in those days. And I'm in the office, and I'm alone, and I log into 23andMe, and I look at mine first because I'm, I'm fairly self-involved. And, there's, and there's, there's, there's nothing, and there's nothing interesting in there. It's like so boring, and now I'm like, oh, I spent 150 bucks on that. Then I pull up Jill's results, which of course was illegal, but I had her login, and she didn't want it, and I had filled it out, and she wasn't interested in this at all. And I go through it, and it says something, you go through all the boring things, and then there's a section where it talks about like BRCA, and it says, click here, you know, you better be careful, these results are super serious, and don't do anything as a result. And there's a warning screen, I go through the warning screen, and it says she has BRCA1. And, it's, and it says in there, like, well, and it has a heightened risk of breast cancer throughout your life. And my first thought is, is that it isn't really like a heightened, that it's like anything. It's like when they tell you that you've got a heightened risk of, uh, of hypertension or something like that. I didn't in that first moment think this is a thing. And bear in mind, this is 2011, and there wasn't, you guys founded the Bassler Center what year? Okay, so this is, and there's no Angelina Jolie, and this is not that well known, okay? I Google, and I will tell you within 10 seconds I knew. I, I knew immediately. I knew immediately how bad this was. I knew immediately how conclusive it was. And it wasn't like when you look up a rash on your face 
or you and it was every article was like this is what this gene makes and i remember at the time the stats were every decade of your life that is the percentage of breast cancer is it still is that still the conventional wisdom these days and then it accelerated it but you kind of knew oh my god once jill and we're married and we're happy and we're going to be together and i'm like wow she's going to be 60 years old and she's going to have a 60 to 70 percent chance of getting this and her father's got it and so i read four articles and then i call her up and I said, Jill, I said, I just looked at this thing and it's really bad. And it says you're going to get breast cancer and it's really bad odds and you have this gene. And Jill says, no, my sister doesn't have the gene. And since she doesn't have the gene, I can't have the gene. Um, but she did, right? And I'm forever indebted to 23andMe despite the controversy. And I'm forever indebted to Ann Wojcicki, who's, who's an amazing woman who founded this company and got, and got this thing going. So – I, it's a little bit of a blur between then, but we went to a second opinion, a guy, a Presbyterian, was he at New York Presbyterian, a very good genetic counselor. And what, I remember walking out with Jill onto the street and being like, wow, this is not even like one way or the other. I've never seen something where everybody is so consistent. We went to a few doctors. They were all unbelievably consistent about how bad this was, how predictive this was. And they try, to, they try a bit to feign like, there's some choice. And, but they're, they're telling you there's some choice, I think, because it's a hard thing to say to a person, you need to get a mastectomy. Like, but, but deep down, they, they know that's the right thing. We knew that was the right thing for us. And um, I knew right away that I thought that Jill should do it. And then what I struggled with a little bit was that it was her body. It was her. And I, 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 and, I, and I feel at times in our relationship over the years, we've been married going on 10 years, that I can be more strong-willed. I'm always worried about pushing Jill into a decision that she doesn't want to make. Um, it's funny. My parents have an apartment in Palm Beach. I love Palm Beach. And my dad wanted me to buy an apartment in the same building, which I really wanted to do. And I said to Jill, you really sure you want to do this? And I, you know, she was convinced that she wanted to do it. I'm like, okay, we're not taking any other vacations. We're going to that apartment in Palm Beach. And she's like, yes, I definitely want to do it. And this was a bit like that, actually. You know, I, I wanted to really make sure that it was her, it was her decision. And I think, and, and she came to it and she decided um, that she wanted to have the mastectomy. That took longer than I thought it would be to tell. Okay, so... The procedures were very complicated, and I'm sorry, tell me your name again. Kate, and it was not, and in, in, hearing Caitlin, Jill and I looked at each other and said how remarkably similar it was. Um, Jill did not want to have breast implants, and I've cleared this all that she wants me to give you all these details. And because, again, I imagine there are some people in the room who are, who have, are newly diagnosed and some husbands who are in the seat that I was in. Um, she didn't want to have breast implants, and she wanted to have the flap surgery, which is where they take fat out of your stomach and they form the breast out of that. Um, and I and I, I'll be honest with you. I, I didn't. I, I felt like it was not gonna be. I, I had concerns about it. Like I, but but she wanted to do it. And it was her choice. Um, she went through it, and it was a very very difficult procedure. It was a very tough procedure, and the flap ended up being, I think, much more difficult than she could have imagined. Um, and she had bad bleeding, and they had to take her out of the recovery room in the middle of the night and take her back into surgery. Um, and she got out, and she had the breasts, and she was pretty quickly soon after, as the swelling went down, she was unhappy with the breasts. Now, I think it's a journey. I think it's a journey, and I think that I, I do believe that, that, that she made the right decision for her, and she went through that path, and then we went back in, and the surgeon, what's Jamie's last name? It's amazing what you remember, what you don't remember. He was a wonder. I love the guy. I can't remember his name because every time I saw him, my mind was like scrambled eggs, and we, we saw him several times. Joe went back several times several surgeries to get it right, and she got it right. Um, and it is an amazing thing that when you go to these gatherings, I mean, we've been lucky to be part of this for a number of years, and I feel awkward saying this is like all the women in this group have the most amazing breasts now because because it's like everybody has like perky, amazing breasts. And when we went to the benefit, it's like you go around this benefit and, and every woman has like this breast, you know? And, you know, and it's very funny. It's a very weird thing that everyone's here and everyone has perfect breasts. Um, um, I think it's very hard to know what to say. And I think as a husband, it was very hard. And you, you, tell, you tell your wife that you love her because you do love your wife. I love my wife. And you tell your wife that she's beautiful to you. But it, it never, it never you, you feel like it's never enough. You feel like it's never convincing. It, it, you never quite know how she feels about her, her new body in this context. And that's, that's a struggle, I think. And it's hard to figure out how... Um, you know, to navigate that. 
And it's definitely jarring at first. And I think that denying that, um, I think that de denying that as a husband or denying that as a significant other can be the wrong impulse. Um, your partner looks different. It's different. It's very, very different. And especially with the nipples and the scarring, um, it's new. It quickly becomes, um, it quickly becomes how you know that person, but it's a very dramatic change. And I, I, it, it's, you're, you're, you're torn at times how to acknowledge it. Um, but I think you have to kind of try to find a way to, to, to work your way through it. And I'm jumping around a little bit, but when I knew that it was sort of right is after a period of time, Jill talked about how much it meant for her to be with the children and how amazing her life with the children was, and me, but with the children was, and that she couldn't imagine something happening in her 60s that would mess this up, and that this was the way she wanted it to be, and thank God that she had this surgery because it made life the way that it should be in the future. And that, I think, is where I take the most comfort that ultimately it was the right thing. And the term mastectomy is a very weird and harsh term because growing up, the women I knew that had mastectomies had terrible cancer. And I knew a few. I knew a few friends' mothers who had, and, and they were so ill and so sick at the time that they had mastectomy that when you think of that term, you think of lost hair and you think of this you know, terribly traumatic thing. So whenever we tell people that Jill had a mastectomy or you use that term, it's, it's, it's the best analogy I can give you is that you sometimes you are in a setting where you talk about a penis or a vagina in a completely appropriate setting, and it still feels kind of awkward to use that word, even when, when referring to it in, a, in, a, in an acceptable sense. And that's how the term mastectomy feels. And, you know, not to be overly politically correct about it, but I feel I, I don't like the word. It feels quite not right for the procedure that gets done in advance and of avoiding um, of having this kind of prophylactic move. And we're not done. We're really not done. And, and you know, we, we have the, um, she has the uh, tubes out, the ovaries come out, and she's, she's concerned about um, menopause and what that will mean and what that will be like this early in life. So there's, there's stresses that go on with this thing, I think, for years to come. Okay, how does one think about this? It's the strangest thing to think about. It is a little bit like Minority Report. It is a little bit like trying to prevent a future crime and then never actually knowing if the future crime would have, would have occurred. It is a little bit like back to the future. Um, and you t I think you do live with that every day. And you live every day with the question of, of, you know, did we need to do this? Did my wife need to do this? Did I need to do this? I don't think Jill, as we talk about it, I don't think Jill struggles with it as much as I do because I think that the risk and the danger to her was was so inordinate that when you weigh odds that are in the 80-odd percentages, that like leaving 13% or 20% on the table feels like a good bet. But it is, but it is a very strange bet to make. Um, the other thing in talking about what someone goes through with this is I think you get into an odd weighing of of relative badnesses. And by that, what I mean is I had BRCA, I had the mastectomy, but it's not as bad as cancer, but I didn't have cancer. And I, whenever you get into a situation where you're weighing terrible things, I think it be, it, they say you're not supposed to do that, but inevitably you do do that. So I, I, don't, I don't have a conclusion on how to think about that, but it just is something that I think that goes through your head. The best analogy that I can give to all this is when you're on an airplane and they tell you that the plane is going to be, there's something wrong with the plane and it may be delayed a little bit, are you the person that pulls out your phone and books another flight right away? Because you know that that fucking plane is not taking off, <laughs> right? That, 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 and I think that that is the approach that I have had to life and that I've developed more in life over the years. And I think that as a person, you've got to ask yourself, do you want to rebook the plane ticket immediately because you just don't trust Delta? Or do you like your odds of sitting on that plane? Um, and I guess I am sort of making a judgment because I feel so strongly that there is no way that that plane is taking off. But some people do sit on that plane, and some people actually do get off into the air on that plane. But I think over time, as Jill and I have bound, you know, bonded as a couple and become a one over these 10 years, um, we, we get off that plane. We get off that plane, we buy the next ticket, and we leave all those suckers on the plane. And I, I think that that is very much um, what this is like. 
I, I have loved the line, the Einstein line, uh, God does not play dice with the universe. And this is, a, this is a very misunderstood line. Einstein did not believe in God. What this line meant is that he did not believe in quantum physics. Quantum physics, which of course proved to be true, which was that there was this kind of random noise that governed the universe and that things were unpredictable and that things were not neat. But Einstein believed that things were preordained and that there were rules that governed everything. And that is a bit how I feel about this gene. I do think that that 23 and me kit, I do think this thing gives you a roadmap into the future. I do think this thing is all set as a path of what's going to happen. And I think you need to take action on it. And I think that we do. And I, I, I think that it's very hard for me to have any other opinion than someone that has this gene and has this family history that you, you, the right step is to take action around this. The odds are too, too high, despite all the trauma that I've told you that we've gone through. Two more things, and then I'll finish. Um, I've, hired and, I've hired and managed a lot of people over the past few years. I've hired five, six, seven hundred people at this point. Um, I've hired plenty of people and had plenty of people work for me who've gotten cancer. And it's amazing to me, you will have someone get cancer, and they will not miss a beat. They won't miss a beat. They'll keep going. And actually, sadly enough, one person that I worked with for a number of years didn't miss a beat and then inevitably and then ultimately died from it. Then I've had 23-year-olds undergo a breakup with their boyfriend or girlfriend of four weeks who absolutely melt down as a person, you know? And I, I, that's not even a joke. Like, it's almost, it's almost shocking to me um, how strong and enduring and, and how much of a fighter some people can be and how unable some people are to deal with that. And I guess the moral there is, if you get struck with this thing, I hope you're strong, or I hope you, I hope you get to be strong. Um, the other thing, too, I guess the other side of that is that we'll often hire someone or have someone come to work with us, and then they'll end up being a complete flake, and they'll end up being like, like the worst, right? And I'm sure many of you have had this experience. And people will say, but Sally or Bob, but they weren't like that. They got such great recommendations. They were so great. The work they did at Google was so amazing. And the, the expression that I've come to in the past few years is it's not the same person. It's just not. The people change so much over the course of a year or the course of an experience. It, it's amazing how dramatically people change. And, and I think this has made us stronger. It's made us more balanced people. It's made us have a, have a broader view of the world. Um, and I would say inevitably that as you go through this journey, um, there are many days that you will get punched in the face. And you will get punched in the face multiple times. You will think that this surgery is done. You will think that it is concluded, and it will not be. You will have a lump in your breast as a result of, of what does the tissue do? Scar tissue. And you will think, is it a tumor? And you'll, the, you'll, the doctor will tell you, no, but come in, and then you'll have a little scare or the breasts will have a problem, or this will have a problem. It's never, it's never quite done in the way that you think it would. But as you get those punches in the face, um, you, you have to get back up and hit back twice as hard. I mean, just, just you have to be so absolutely tireless and ferocious and be unwilling to ever give up as you face this situation. So that's all I got.